characterization and production. And this is a field uh, in Algeria that I had a chance to work on some years ago. And uh, here's a, a, a structure map of the field. So you've got an anticlinal structure here, a high point here, and uh, getting deeper down uh, away from that high point, and then a major fault along this boundary right there. And if we look at a couple of uh, cross sections, uh, here this B, B prime cross section is this one right here. And the reservoir, here's the reservoir interval. It's uh, sitting on basement, and the green is oil and the red is gas. So you see there's a big uh, oil leg there, and then a smaller gas cap right there at that particular uh, cross section. We go down to this cross section here, that's this one down here, and we uh, don't have the gas cap there, we still have the oil leg, but uh, no gas cap down there. So with other work, we, we were able to uh, uh, put in the fluid contacts, and so what you see here in green is oil water contact. So water down here, oil in there, and then here's the gas oil contact. So here's your gas cap right here. Here's your uh, oil leg, and then your um, uh, water leg down there. So water, oil, gas. Now, uh, so there's a structural component to this reservoir. The uh, fluid contact butt up against the fault, for example, and uh, the fault gives you uh, uh, tectonic structure, structurally high. But what I want to focus on is the uh, stratigraphy. Well, I, when I was in Algeria, I had the opportunity to go describe uh, a core from this field. I was in Algeria, I, I worked in the oil industry at that time, and uh, uh, the Algerian government uh, wanted to open up their fields to Western technology. And so I worked for a Western company at the time, and so I was part of a team. Uh, there was me and a reservoir engineer, physicist and a geophysicist uh, that all went to Algeria to look at data. They had set up a data room for us, uh, us and other companies, to try to bid on coming in and helping develop this reservoir. Now this was a giant reservoir, about four billion barrels of oil, so big reservoir. Uh, but they were only able to produce about, uh, uh, they felt that the resource, the producible resource or reserve was about two billion barrels. Uh, and all of that was confined to the upper part of the reservoir, up in this area here, and for some reason they could not uh, develop, uh, they were getting no uh, production from the lower part of the reservoir even though it was in the oil zone, the production was very poor. So uh, one of the things that I did, being a geologist, uh, one of the first things I did was uh, go and look at core. So I had the opportunity to uh, go and describe a core, and I know you can't see very much here of this, but uh, my core description goes something like this. Uh, basically, you have two different rock types. You had one rock type, which is shown in, in B here. All these little symbol, symbols are uh, have meaning for geologists. They may not have meaning, meaning for petroleum engineers, but they do for geologists. 
And but uh, basically, this was a type of sandstone that had been deposited in a marine environment in a shoreline type setting. And that was kind of this part of the reservoir up to about there. Then the other, so that was one type of reservoir rock, and that's the type they were able to produce from. They didn't have any problems uh, producing uh, primary production from the uh, core structure. Uh, but when they tried to produce from this down in here, uh, they got a very poor production. And so just a little piece of what that rock looked like, my little symbols here, uh, this lower section of rock was deposited as a braided river type deposit, okay? Like maybe some of your reservoirs are. So, two rock types, marine sandstone, and actually this uh, 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 braided river deposit was pretty coarse grain, pebbles and sand and so on. Well, when you looked at the permeability and the porosity, uh, this is what the profiles look like. Permeability uh, increased and was pretty high in this zone here, which was this zone up here. And then it dropped off dramatically by a couple of orders of magnitude, from say 100 millidarcies down to less than one millidarcy permeability. And that all of the way down was that very low permeability, and that was uh, this rock here. Now, porosity showed the opposite effect, that the porosity up here was pretty low, relatively low, 5 to 10 percent. But then, and, and that again was this upper part of the reservoir, that marine sandstone. But the lower part, the uh, Braden River deposit, uh, had uh, high porosity. So what would give you a, 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 and this again, this was the interval that they were not getting any production from, and that was the interval why they wanted Western technology to come in and see if there wasn't something that a company could do that had a different type of technology that might be uh, uh, able to determine that and increase production uh, down in the lower part of the reservoir. So when you plotted these uh, porosity and permeability trends, you got one trend like this, and you got another trend like that. Two different trends, there are some intermediate stuff here, but basically a trend here and a trend there. So the question became, why do you have, whoops, why do you have two trends? Well, it turns out that this, this trend here is kind of a normal, which you often see when you make a porosity versus permeability cross plot, where porosity increases as uh, permeability does. But here, this zone down in here was quite different. You've got a big range of porosity with very little change in permeability, all less than one millidarcy. And so, uh, going back here, the normal zone was up in here, and that was this normal marine rock, normal marine sandstone, and the lower zone had the low permeability, but high and variable porosity. And that was this rock down here. Well, so there were two different, um, uh, two different trends. And the reason for that, I thought I had a diagram in here, but I think it's further down in the, my next lecture. But uh, you had two different rock types here. 
the marine sandstone had all good interconnected pores. So the flow of the fluid was easy through that. So they could produce it well. Down here, though, different rock type, graded river deposit, what you had were isolated holes, isolated pore spaces amongst kind of a muddy, sandy matrix. And the reason that you had these isolated holes or pores was because a certain mineral had dissolved. When it was buried, it dissolved. And that mineral is called feldspar. It's not very stable when you bury it and it's subject to being dissolved under high temperatures and pressures, like when you bury. And so every time you had a feldspar grain in your, in your graded river deposit, it had been dissolved and gave you an isolated pore. One here and one here, and they weren't connected. And so that's why you had high porosity, but low permeability for that interval. And so it turned out to be a very easy solution to the problem. We asked the company, uh, the Algerian uh, government company, Sonatrach, we asked them if um, they fractured. They did artificial fracturing. No, didn't do any artificial fracturing. They said, well, there's the answer. If you go in to this uh, zone down here, where you've got these isolated pores and fracture them, you'll connect the pore spaces and you'll improve your production. So it turned out to be a fairly easy answer to them. And uh, there was a potential for up to 2 billion barrels of oil uh, in, this, in this lower zone down here. The oil water contact was down about here. And so again, fairly easy solution. Uh, just by looking at the core, I could see the different uh, types of, uh, of the two types of rocks and really the two types of porosity. Well, the um, I had been sent there as part of a team to look at these rocks to decide if my company or the company I worked for wanted to buy in and the Algerian government wanted $300 million for us to invest to help them produce, and then we would get a share of the production. And so I knew that, um, well, first of all, the, the petrophysicist and I didn't agree. The petrophysicist said, this is a shaly sand down here. It's a shaly sand that's giving you a shaley sand log response and all that. I said, no, it's not a shaley sand. It's a conglomeratic sandstone that's got isolated holes in it. And so there was that difference of opinion. Uh, and I knew when we got back to our home office that um, we had to have a meeting with the president of the company to see to make a recommendation we should build or invest $300 million into an artificial fracturing program for the government. And I knew that it would be hard for me to convince the president of the company that you really had two different rocks, but two different core types as well. And I figured the only way I could do that was to be to bring samples back with me. The president of the company was a geologist, thank goodness, and uh, so he, that person would look at a rock, okay, not just the logs. Uh, and so what I did is I, I brought two samples back with me, uh, one of this type of rock and one of that type of rock, and was able to convince the uh, president that uh, yeah, we could go in there, this artificial fracture, which we had been doing, what this company I worked for had been doing for a long time, and artificially fracture and improve production. So we went ahead and gave the $300 million and uh, went in as a partner with the company, with 
the uh, uh, Algerian government company and uh, helped uh, produce, and it worked out pretty well. Uh, after all, we did get our, not only our money back, but made a profit on it and uh, all of that. So again, fairly simple, just look at the rocks. You should always look at rocks when you've got rocks to look at. You don't always have rocks to look at, but if you do, you should always look at them. And uh, this was a very good success story just by looking at the rocks. Okay, um, so just to finish up this section, um, how do you recognize compartmentalized reservoirs? Well, there are a series of properties, uh, uh, some called static reservoir properties. Those are properties that don't change over the life of a field. And then there are dynamic reservoir properties that do change over the life of the field. So um, the static properties are the stratigraphy, the rocks the way they were deposited, the geometry of the rocks as they were deposited, the rock types, the lithology, capillarity will change. Uh, that shouldn't really be there uh, because that will change over the life of the field. Um, and the structure won't change. So, and these are all determined by well log, uh, mapping, correlation, sample analysis, uh, seismic, <laughs> and so on. The dynamic reservoir properties, the ones that do change over the course of the, uh, uh, the, field, the life of the field, are uh, the pressures, 4D seismic, that's uh, shooting multiple 3D seismic surveys at one location using the same uh, shooting acquisition parameters. Uh, fluid geochemistry, saturations, fluid contacts, uh, gas oil ratio and water oil ratio, and your uh, porosity and permeability, uh, which will change over time, particularly your permeability. So, to finish up this, the type of people again, and what their questions are in expiration. These are the questions we asked, I talked about them before, and in development, Appraisal and development, these are the types of questions before, uh, that you ask. And I'll just close on the note about this people issue. It's really interesting that, that I've found in my career that, uh, like I said earlier, some people like the big picture sort of thing, uh, exploration geologists, uh, and they just hate doing detailed work, you know, with, plotting porosity and permeability and stuff like that. Then there are other people that really like the detail but don't like the concepts. They want to work with hard data. And if you, and I've seen on some occasions where you have a mismatch of people, you put kind of like an exploration person in a development team, oh, they hate it. You know, they just can't wait to get out. Say, so, oh, I don't want to look at dirt. Soil, and then you've got some that in a um, exploration that really want to be in development, and uh, uh, so they're unhappy too. So when that happens, when they get assigned to that, so it's kind of important to try to match up your people with what their interests really are. You get much better performance. All right, well that, um, that concludes my introduction. Very long introduction. But uh, what I'd like to start in, and then we'll go to lunch in a while, I'll start in on uh, reservoir quality. And I'm probably going to skip parts of that. Um, most of you are engineers, uh, have a, I'm sure have a good uh, knowledge of 
uh, reservoir property, so some of it I'll probably skip uh, before we then uh, this afternoon. So we'll start. I'll start that now, and we'll do that in the afternoon, and then get into the fluvial and shallow marine uh, later in the afternoon. So let me go 